You're listening to the Hello Awesome Podcast, and this is episode number 13. I am so excited to share with you my interview with the lovely Tiffany Huba Bonilla. Tiffany and I connected through Instagram years ago and have since remained social media buddies, even collaborating a few times. She has a classy flair for all things fashion and home decor, not to mention a deep love for Jesus and His church. In this episode, we dive into her story of singleness, serving the local church while waiting, and how God truly can use social media as a tool to propel the gospel. I could have talked to this girl for hours. She is so sweet and passionate. Please enjoy today's episode that I am calling Social Media Ministry and Singleness with Tiffany Huba Bonilla. You're listening to the Hello Awesome Podcast. I'm JC, and this is the place where we get real, sharing truthful insights that will encourage us to make intentional choices in both life and business. I want to start conversations that not many young Christians today are having. Will you join me? This podcast episode is sponsored by Blue Thistle Taylor. Blue Thistle Taylor is the place to shop for modest clothing for today's modern godly woman. Elegant and classy, Blue Thistle Taylor is the boutique that can help elevate your wardrobe right now. Hello Awesome listeners can use discount code HELLO15 for 15% off your order today at bluethistletaylor.com. That's www.bluethistletaylor.com. You can also head on over to Instagram to give Blue Thistle Taylor a follow, and you can find all of these links in the show notes. Hey guys, this is JC from the Hello Awesome Podcast. I am so excited today. I have Tiffany Huba Bonilla on the phone, and she is here with me for an interview for the podcast. I cannot wait to talk with her and for you guys to get to know her more. So Tiffany, can you just... uh, do us a favor and share a little bit about yourself, who you are, and a brief background of what you do for everybody listening. Thank you, JC. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to share a little bit more about myself because I know a lot of times we can see people online and not really know what they are really about. And I, I'm thankful for this opportunity that I can share a little bit of my heart and also be exposed to what you do. So, um, as you said, my name is Tiffany Huba Bonilla. I am 28. I am married to my very best friend, my better half. I have two sisters, one brother-in-law, and a baby niece that is absolutely perfect, and her name is Ella. I'm super excited about that. She is pretty brand new to the world. I currently live in Terre Haute, Indiana, and I was born and raised in Florida, though. So, I will always be a Florida girl, and as those from Tallahassee, Florida would say I'm a Tallahassee lassie. Uh, My father has pastored since I was one and a half years old. So the pastor daughter life is my life for sure. I attended Florida State University and I received my communication degree um, specializing in media communications with a minor in religion, which went hand in hand with my time at Indiana Bible School. I went there for one year on a music scholarship in between my associate's So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. Um, I currently work with the Florida State as um, a graphic designer, and I do some other things within their internal trainings, as well as dabble in anything and everything that has to do with style and fashion and home decor. And I'm currently working my way towards um, creating my own business and ultimately fulfilling that dream. That is so amazing. I love that. I did not know that you went to Bible college for a year. I love learning new things from people. So, uh, yes, today I want to chat with you about beauty and singleness and waiting. And I also want to talk about, you know, sharing life on social media because that's a big part of your life, too. Um, First, serious question for you. Which came first, YouTube or Instagram? (laughs) Well, when I read this question, I laughed and I wrote Facebook. <laughs> because oh, yeah, yeah. Because even, yeah, cause, but no, Facebook and YouTube kind of at the same time. So, yeah, um, sharing my life on social media, 
this could be a really long answer, but it is something that's just kind of become an organic ministry that, um, you know, there's not really a rule book for it. There's not really many people who have gone before us that have used social media, as you know, for ministry, but it mm-hmm. is a great avenue. And um, I actually made a silly video on Facebook. This is how it all started. I started a little bit after high school. So about when I was like 21, 22, and I made a funny video about silly questions people ask girls of my faith. And somebody had commented on there, like, hey, you should make a serious video. And I went to my dad. I said, you know, dad, I was like, I've went to public school my whole life. I've had conversations with people, but I don't really feel confident in the answers that I get a lot of time. Like, I don't really feel knowledgeable enough to defend my faith. It all started with me creating a video and I just looked, it almost has 200,000 views at this point. And um, I've had a lot of young girls say, thank you, I couldn't explain it. And so I would just send my friends this video because they had questions. And really it just was me wanting to be able to really explain my lifestyle, my beliefs, and just creating a video. And from there I created more and Um, from Facebook to YouTube, and then ultimately I got to Instagram, and now Instagram is probably my largest platform, and that's just been um, not so much videos, but sharing thoughts and, of course, other lifestyle inspirations. That's fantastic. I love how it came about so organically because it was something that you looked at as a tool to almost help a situation. Oh, yeah. I mean, to this day, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing with it or really know what I should be doing or should not be doing or how I should approach it. But more and more, like this is something that God gave me that um, one of the reasons why the gospel spread, scripture shows us that it was the invention of the Roman road. This was a secular development. This was something that the Christian church did not fund. They did not have the idea for it. But because these roads were created, technology advanced, they were able to take the gospel in places they had never gone to before. And I believe the internet today is our Roman road. And it has truly given us places to go that we, we could never go physically. And so I've truly seen the power of it. And it's just it's humbling and it's exciting to be a part of using it for God's kingdom. I feel the same way. I really do. And actually um, in previous interviews um, that haven't aired yet, but they will, we do talk about uh, this same topic because I feel like um, one of the things that have come up is back in the day, in the day, quote unquote, um, it wasn't like a, a thing, you know, having the internet. So we weren't really aware of, other people as much and what they were doing. Yeah, we get to see, you know, what they're up to. Um, They get to share parts of their lives, but we also get a chance to share our life too, including our faith. And I think that's such an amazing tool if we use it properly. And I really do feel like God is raising up a new generation of believers who will use this tool for the gospel, for God's glory. Yes, I absolutely agree. Now, how have you seen God move through your ministry, both offline and online? Um, I know that's a pretty broad question, but particularly online, since we're talking about this now, how have you seen God move through, you know, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram for you? Well, I tell you what, I actually just had a lady today I met in person. I bought a coffee table off of her, off of Facebook Marketplace. And, you know, I... I don't think anything's a coincidence. I do believe in divine orchestration. And so I get the table from her. I'm so nice. Like, thank you so much. And she goes, hey, I watched some of your videos and they really are inspiring. And it like, I was like taken by surprise. I was like, wow, like here's, I just thought this lady was just selling me her table, but she was looking into my life. And that literally happened today. And that happens all the time. And I found the power of social media because something that I didn't really think that was significant, when you expose yourself, you expose the quality of living that you have, 
people want to know more. How I've seen it played out in real life, I mean, you see more of it online because you're reaching more people online. I've had people in the Philippines. I've had people in France. I've had people from all over the world message me and say, hey, I saw your video and I went and got baptized in Jesus' name. One particular situation was a guy who was raised Muslim. He had went to an apostolic church a few times when he was a kid, but, you know, kind of went back to his Islamic faith because of his family. Well, when he came back, he served in the military here in the U.S. When he came back home, him and his girlfriend were having some issues. And he said, you know, we've got to get married. We've got to do this right. And so he started doing research again. He found my video and it helped one of my videos that helped explain the plan of salvation and the oneness of God. And it re confirmed the things that he had been exposed to just a little bit when he was a kid. So somehow he ended up finding my dad's number, the church's number and calls and says, Hey, can you help me find a church in my area? That night after my dad contacted me, we found him a church. He drove an hour and a half to the closest United Pentecostal church to get baptized in Jesus name. So I have countless stories of that. You know, not all of them are necessarily led to the point of salvation, but even if it's a, a little bit of encouragement, you never know how that planted seed will come down, you know, and how it will come into fruition later down the road. And I've, I've had stories of people who say, hey, you know, you're apostolic. There's a lady at my work that's apostolic. And, you know, what exactly do you believe? I had another girl who was raised Jewish, and she found my profile just from a fashion post and said, oh, man, I really, really admire your approach to fashion with modesty. I was always raised to be very modest, but I have a hard time connecting to my faith. Mm. Found out she lives wow. in West Palm Beach, where a good friend of mine lives. Ended up getting my friend Hannah to contact her. They end up doing a Bible study, and she ends up getting baptized in Jesus' name, is in church today because of an outfit I posted. And sometimes we can look at things at surface value and not realize that it could be a connecting point to people, to the bigger picture. Right. That's so beautiful. I love that. I love both of those stories, Tiffany, because I can just see, um, I have a different background than you. Um, I was not born in church. And so a lot of the stories that I've heard, it didn't really resonate with me. But what, what really did was when people were authentic and real and when they really truly believed in the truth and they lived it. And I remember just the different situations, how God brought me to where I am now. And he did use, um, you know, the internet one way or another so that I could connect with my future husband. And it's just amazing how, you know, when we let God be God, he can use the internet too, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've seen God do so many things through it that it's crazy to me when people are like, no, I don't have social media or no. And I'm like, but you call yourself a minister. Like you have a voice, you have influence, you have the Holy Ghost. Like people need to be exposed to that. People are searching and the internet is very innovative. It's, it's not something that you're knocking on people's doors. They can come to you. And that's the most powerful tool because Christianity has not always been the best when it came to evangelism. They didn't have a lot of social skills or wisdom when it came to it. But this is truly putting the gospel in people's hands. You know, the devil wants to use our phones and devices to put other things, other things to destroy our lives and give us addictions with. But we can say, hey, you know, you're searching for something to be entertaining here. Watch our church's live feed. You know, you're, you're want to find something fashionable, check out this outfit. It's fashionable, but also res it re makes you respect yourself. So I truly believe that the church needs to get on board with using the internet for true end time revival. Absolutely. I, I a hundred percent agree. Um, what would you say to someone who maybe feels a little intimidated to start sharing their faith online? You know, they want to share their journey. You know, maybe they see your account. Maybe they see, you know, mine or other people who are more outspoken and bold, but they're not sure how to, like, start. What would you say to that person? Well, first thing I would say is don't overthink it. And don't wait to be perfect before you put your testimony out there. I saw, actually, a social media influencer. He was just like a, a tech guy. Had nothing to do with 
Christianity, but he said, quantity is greater than quality sometimes. And yes, aesthetics and technology matter, he says, but the more you have out there, the more chances somebody can find you. I'm not a professional. You can look at my videos on YouTube and there's some, some of the videos I cringe, you know, some of my photos on Instagram are like, oh, why did I use that filter? I look so <laughs> orange, you know, you can look back at that and, and yeah, it might not have been professional or top notch, but I worked with what I got, what I had and working with what you have works. And I found that because people are not always looking for this perfect polished image. They're looking for something they can relate to. And so I have people all the time that say, hey, you need to make more videos. And I go, you need to make some <laughs> because we have to have all of us out there because not everyone's going to relate to me. Not everyone's my personality. Somebody might be more quiet and timid. And if I'm sharing the gospel, my approach, they could say, oh, I'm not like her. So it's not going to work for me. But maybe you are more timid. Maybe you're more shy in your nature. But you still have a voice and you still have a testimony and there will be people that connect to it. I shouldn't be the only voice out there because I'm not the only voice in the only life that's been impacted by Christ. So I'm a huge advocate of people just, just taking that step, you know, step out of the, step out of the boat, Peter, you know, just do it. Don't, you don't have to overthink it. You don't have to have this big logical plan. And I think it is good. And now that I've, taking college classes and studying things I understand marketing and branding and having a strategic plan. But I didn't do that. I didn't pay for followers. I didn't, you know, promote things. I didn't find some type of, you know, gimmick and marketing strategy. I just was myself and I just put myself out there. Now, yeah, you pick up things along the way to be more effective, but you don't have to have a lot. Like when God's in it, you know, it's a cliche saying, but when God is in it, there's no limit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love that. Now, you were talking about how your parents pastor a church in Florida, and you grew up in that environment. Can you tell me what were some of the positive takeaways that you had as you started to venture life on your own that maybe helped you become, you know, so bold about your faith? Oh, absolutely. Well, one thing that being a pastor's daughter taught me or put in me was I was a kind of a Jew of all trades, you know, master of none. But when you're growing up in a smaller church environment and they need all hands on deck, you kind of have to fill in wherever they need you. And sometimes that's not always a good thing because maybe not everything's your calling, but I truly believe that if you have a servant's heart and you're willing to do whatever, you know, if you honor God in the small things, if you're willing to do the things that you don't get glory for, you know, God will honor that and, and ultimately lead you to where you need to be. And so, you know, music was an aspect that, of course, I got into, but I did everything. I did the graphics for church. I did temple keeping. I taught Sunday school. I led the kids choir. I did outreaches. I wrote Easter plays. I did it all. And through those things, not necessarily all were my passion, but I gathered things and took a lot of life lessons from that. And I would say another valuable aspect that I got as being a pastor's daughter was I got a lot of people skills and I got a lot of social skills that I wouldn't have gotten if I maybe would have had a different lifestyle. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be a pastor's daughter, have people skills or social skills. I just think that it was something that came into my life because of where I was at. I had to interact with all different types of people. I had to be put in crazy situations where you have, you know, quiet people come to church and you're trying to talk to them or you have rude people who come to church and you have to talk to them or outreach to them. And so dealing with all of that, I was able to learn like how to maneuver in social situations in places where people are like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable, I'm embarrassed, and this is awkward. I'm like, no, it's not, it's okay. Because I've been there, and I've learned how, when you're confident in yourself, that you can control the conversation and, you know, breathe through it the best you can. And then the other thing I did learn and took from was the value of humility and hard work. You know, not everything you do is going to be acknowledged. Um, you're not going to always get acclimated. You're not going to always get a standing ovation for every single thing you do. And if you're doing it for that, you will be sorely disappointed. But 
I just learned by seeing my parents and then working alongside them that, you know, hard work does pay off. And not always the way that we want it to, because this is God's kingdom, but you do reap what you sow. And I've been so blessed, not because I'm a pastor's daughter and I've been handed certain things within our church culture. No, not at all. I've been so blessed because I've been exposed to the kingdom of God early on in life. And I've got to glean from a lot of people and learn and set myself up. Because here's the thing that I always talk about when it comes to being a pastor's kid. You don't have to be a pastor's kid to be successful in the kingdom of God. Because I've seen plenty of pastor's kids that are not. Actually, it's almost the opposite. I see more pastor's kids walk away and have bitterness and hurt because of the culture that upbringing is. Mm -hmm. But my experience was very positive. You know, of course, I had my situations where people are looking in your glass house and judging everything you do. But I was very, very thankful for that experience because I got to experience life in the kingdom of God up close and personal. Do you feel that that helped you prepare for now that you share your life online, that that helped you kind of prepare for, you know, the things that come with being, you know, now in the public eye, people kind of analyzing you and making comments and, you know, they almost feel like they can hide behind a screen and say and do whatever they want. Um, Do you think being in an environment like that, growing up in a church and being hands-on and seeing your parents deal with certain things, now you're able to kind of deal with criticism a little bit better? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, my dad always raised me and my two sisters that, you know, it's, it's never about you, you know, and sometimes you want to go do something, you want to post something, you want to put something out that maybe you might do p- privately, but you know, it'll offend somebody, it'll make them, you know, depending on different people's point of view or perspectives. And so like, for example, you'll never see me really posting, I mean, unless it's like a love song to my husband, posting a secular song. And I don't listen to secular music just because that's the choice that I've made. But there are some songs that I've heard that are secular that come on that aren't bad. I don't have a problem with it. But I've just learned being a pastor's daughter and then now being in a place where you have both sides looking at you that it's always better to go, my dad would always say, it's always better to go the more conservative, safe route, because the Bible talks about not offending your brother. And so I would say that's probably the the biggest issue within some of the church cultural things is that, you know, there's certain things that I avoid posting, because I know, within my faith circle, some things that people believe, even if I don't have a personal conviction about it, or I don't say something about my personal conviction, even if it's what I would say greater than somebody else's, because you forget that you're not just ministering to church people. And I've really pulled back a lot when it comes to some of the church cultural uh, vernacular and some of the arguments that we've always to have with one another. I get some people that get angry that I post about Christmas. I'm not going to change that (laughs) because (laughs) I will still keep celebrating Christmas. I'm sorry that offends you, but you know, there's, there's those things that I take note of, but I also remember that I don't ever want to have an argument with somebody in church online because that's going to just expose and put the church in a bad light. Yeah. And then I'm also not going to have an argument with somebody who doesn't have a right spirit or doesn't really want to know. So I've had several people who've made videos attacking me, calling me out, wanting me to have a debate with them. And years ago, I would have said like, okay, I'm gonna make a video. And I remember for the longest time, and even to this day, I will talk to my dad if I'm gonna post something, you know, a little controversial. And I'll say, hey, is this, what do you think about this? And my dad's very wise. And he's always been very good about helping me kind of filter through those things and know if it's really worth your time. And, you know, you're not going to please everybody, you know, and you don't want to feel like you can never post anything because somebody's going to think this or that. Um, But I would always say, just always look at your page from the view of an unbeliever. And what would somebody think? And like I said, I've really been more intentional with what I've posted, because I do know that I'm not just ministering to church people. And I don't want to ever isolate somebody who may come across my page searching for more. 
And I don't want them to feel like we're a club where they can't belong. So being in the church as a pastor's daughter and bringing it back into now doing social media and being in a more public view, it has really helped me find that balance in life to remember that this is not about me and it's about the kingdom. And so it's not what does Tiffany want to post. And sometimes, yeah, it is something I want to post. So you don't have to feel for those listening. You don't have to feel like you're living in a prison and you can never post anything and you have to overthink everything. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as your pastor and your spiritual leaders are okay with it, then I say go for it. But, you know, just always keeping in mind of not ascending the burden and, and of course, always keeping that conversation open with the unbeliever. That's so important. Those are very good, important points. And I think it's very easy for us to kind of, you know, only see our own little box and forget that um, there are other people watching us. So I am very excited that you expounded on that. Um, now, this is going to be a broad question, but maybe you can summarize um, as you've been working in the ministry for a while, now married, but before, how did singleness look like for you as an unmarried young lady, you know, active in ministry? I know most of the church culture has kind of different perspectives on this. So I kind of wanted to know what was your first person perspective? Well, I would say in the last days I wrote, <laughs> um, my experience of singleness as a, a young lady in ministry was lonely, <laughs> but it was also my driving force. So I think it's okay for me to say lonely to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, you do feel those feelings. You do feel those emotions. You are wanting that special someone in your life, you know, but I, my first boyfriend was at 23. So in Pentecost years, I should have already been married with five kids, you know? So yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of already went against that stereotype, but you know, you get to that point. So I didn't get married till I was 27 and, um, or 26 turning 27, like a month later. And it, it was, those years were very, very trying because I had gotten to the point where I was giving so much to God in my mind, you know, you're, you can never outgive God and you can never, you know, pay a debt that you owe for eternity. But, you know, in your mind, you're like, God. And I, I remember I had this moment where I was just so frustrated and I said, God, I've been so good. I'm not going around sleeping around with everybody and I'm not doing this and I'm not acting like this and so and so. And of course, you look on social media and I always look, the grass always looks greener when somebody uses a filter. Oh, we need to sleep that. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> you know, we we can always look at other people's lives and feel like they're happy and fulfilled and they're at peace where they're at. We have no clue. You know, I had friends that got married and I thought, oh my gosh, even she got married and she has an attitude problem. You know, only for her to get divorced a, a less than a year later. So you know, we don't always look at the outside and think that your life is lacking because somebody else is at a place that society and our church culture says is success in the next step. So, you know, it was, like I said, lonely at times, but it was ultimately my driving force. Mm -hmm. I used that thinking, I need to use this time while I can. And so I just kept myself so busy, so busy. And everything I wanted to do because I just did not want to have any regrets. I had friends that got married and had kids and they would text me and they'd say, Oh, you traveled so much and it looks so fun. I, I, you know, I'm changing diapers and I've got this and that. And it's like, we forget that everything's a season and your singlehood does not last forever. One day you will be married wishing that you could have a day to just be single and, you know, not have to talk to somebody or worry about kids, you know. And so I think the biggest thing for me was, is I tried to take advantage of that time. And I really feel like I don't have any regrets, you know. It's actually now that I'm married, I'm like, maybe I could have done more. But then I thought, but no, I was at that point that I was just ready for the next step. I wasn't any good to God in <laughs> some of those nights. But I was, I was thankful for the time I had, you know, it's not everybody's story. And I think some people, it's good for them to get married earlier, depending on their personality or their life story. But this was mine. I didn't choose it, but I'm thankful for it because 
I know that that time helped develop me and my husband and ultimately give us um, a happy and healthy marriage and ministry together. Yeah, that's so amazing. Um, I know from my perspective, um, I've been in the church 12 years now, and I went from being in a relationship outside of being saved to all of a sudden being in a relationship while I was saved. So I didn't have much of an in-between time to be single. And um, it was definitely a culture shock, first of all, coming into the church aspect and then to see the culture of dating in the church and how different it was compared to, you know, secular. And that shocked me. Uh, But then realizing we're all human and then seeing church people doing what secular people do, that shocked me. So, um, (laughs) yeah. You know, sometimes when you are single or when you see your single friends, um, sometimes they feel like or there's this attitude of like, oh, I need to be married in order to start working in ministry. It's like this lie that we believe sometimes. And I want to know, um, what would you say to someone who might be dating, but they're like confused about the direction like that it's going because you said you had a boyfriend before. And I know this from personal experience. But I wanted to know, what would you say to that person if they feel like, oh, yeah, you know, this relationship is probably not, you know, 100%, but, you know, we're going to get married soon. Or they're kind of looking at that as like the goal or the reward, but then they're kind of confused too about it. What what would you say to that person? Well, I would say, um, so I, like I said, my first boyfriend was when I was 23 that ended in a way that it wasn't desired by either one of us, but outside forces caused it. And then I dated one other guy before Jonathan. I learned from both of these relationships and the other one, it ended and I was very thankful that it did. And I was the one who made sure that it was over because I wanted my life to go in a good direction. But through those situations, I learned how to kind of read the signs. And so when I, when I met Jonathan, I, I've always said I wasn't ever playing games, but I was very, very, very upfront and intentional. I don't believe that a woman should be forward, but I do believe that you can be straight up. (laughs) Yes, definitely. And and I would say that if you are hesitant, you need to ask why. Mm. You need to say, why do I feel this resistance? Because it could be you. It could be past hurt. It could be fear. You know, I have friends that, have dated great guys and they're like, Oh, I don't know. But they had dated a jerk before and they see this other amazing guy as evil and bad because of their previous hurt. So their hesitancy wasn't because the Holy ghost or God, you know, God was saying, don't do this. It was that they had fear and anxiety and doubt from previous situations that maybe they should have not even been in. So I think the biggest aspect of, that whole situation when you're in a relationship and you're wondering where it should go. If you feel that resistance, there's a reason. Now, first you can say, is it me? If it's not you, then you need to ask God, why are you feeling that? I I've had some friends who they were in a relationship for a long time. And every time that person mentioned marriage, it made them sick. It made them afraid. They wanted to run we get comfortable. We get in situations where like, I've just known this person forever and we we're friends. So why not? You know? And I didn't want that. I didn't want that to be my story when it came to me and my husband, Jonathan, I wanted to be able to tell people that I had waited. And then I knew, and I, I had without a shadow of a doubt confirmation from multiple sources that it was God's will. And the more you hold on to a relationship that you're hesitant in, the more damage that will be done because you are intertwining yourself with something that might not be your forever. I had a minister's wife do a session one time and it was totally random. I don't even know why she called us. I mean, obviously God was using her in that moment, but she said she wanted to speak to um, a few of those girls that were doing an internship when I, I did an internship in Maryland. Um, after Bible school and she pulled us all up to office. I think there was only like 10 of us girls and she talked about emotional purity. It was a powerful moment. I mean, we were all crying and just speaking in tongues and just praying because 
what she revealed to us is we can always talk about, oh, you know, I'm not sleeping around. I'm not being immoral in my purity. She brought to our attention every person we open ourselves up to. And that can, that can also play into friendships. But especially since we're talking about relationships, when you're opening yourself up to a man that's not going to be your husband and you're not sure about that, you can never get that stuff back. Like she said, you could tell some, a man, a guy that you're dating, I'm, a, I'm afraid of the dark. I'm a, I have to sleep with a nightlight on. You, you can laugh and you can say, oh, that's silly. But now every time that man sees you, every time you're around him, he can have that knowledge of you and you have that holding over you like, oh, he knows, you know. Of course, the sleeping in the night is a simple situation. We have a lot deeper and darker secrets that we reveal to people when we're dating. So my biggest thing is, is if you're uncertain about the direction, if it's not leaning towards marriage in a positive way, and I'm not just talking about, oh, you're ready to get married and make babies, so you're going to make it happen. I'm talking about your parents feel good about it. Your pastor feels good about it. Now you're just having to decide, do I want to spend the rest of my life with this person? You know, if you are feeling that hesitancy, you need to find out why and find out now before any more damage gets done or you get so entangled in something that you feel like you can't walk away and ultimately marrying somebody that is not God's will. That's good. That's so good. And I love that you mentioned emotional purity because that's part of my story. And actually the first book I wrote, The Palace Keepers, is all about emotional purity. And it's something that I think we do need to talk about more because one of the things that I see um, is a lot of people maybe think when they, you know, think of purity, they think of like physical. But when we fall physically in our purity, it always starts on an emotional level first. We can look at that in the Bible all day long. (laughs) And so I love that you shared that. You mentioned confirmation. How important was it for you to receive spiritual confirmation about Jonathan? Oh, it was huge. It was everything for me because of the past relation two relationships that I had that things didn't work out in such stark different ways I had a a clear sign I I knew that I couldn't trust my emotions alone but then I also knew that I could not wait for everybody else to figure it out for me so that being said I made a very very clear clear plan an idea for when Jonathan and I started dating I said okay if this, this, and this, and this go on the line. If this, you know, one thing was my, my father being my pastor, but then also my spiritual head. I trust him because he is a, a true Christian in everything that he does. And he has no ulterior motive. He just loves the Lord and he loves his daughters and his family. And he wouldn't tell me to marry somebody or not marry somebody. He, he would want to know that I, it was my choice, but he also is spiritual and he is also in tune and he's also a man, <laughs> which I was not raised around much. So he can read beyond what I can read. And it's always good to have somebody who's not emotionally invested in the relationship. So that was a big confirmation for me was I said, my parents have to feel good about it, especially my father being my spiritual head. And so my dad was hesitant about the other situation and he would say certain things that he felt but he wouldn't say one or one way or the other he just said I just don't know it was like it was just that kind of uncomfortable feeling that we can you know credit as the Holy Ghost but I would just I that was so huge for me because I said God I haven't come this far I haven't been single this long to marry the wrong one like that's just dumb. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to make these years of waiting worth it. And that's just unfortunately a lot of girls get tired and they end up and they end up settling or not reading the telltale sign. So the spiritual confirmation I had is just the things that I knew that God had spoken in my life that I had to see played out in his. And I don't mean played out as oh, I feel called to be this, so that means he has to be that. No, I'm talking about a willingness to do and be and go wherever God calls him to. And, you know, as long as that's there, sometimes us girls in church culture get fixated on, I'm, I'm called to be a missionary, so I have to marry a guy that's going to be a missionary. My youth pastor's wife, actually, I'll tell him this story. She told me that she knew she was always called to be a, marry a preacher. 
she said, but when she met her husband, he was not. And he, but he drove the church van. He cleaned the toilet. He did everything and anything for the church. And she said, when they started dating, she was like, God, oh, this doesn't make sense. You know, I, I know I'm called to be a, a preacher's wife and a pastor's wife. Like, what is it? But she says, but I feel just something right about him. And so I think we have to go beyond our head. We have to go beyond our social norms and trust the Holy Ghost. And so ultimately they ended up getting married and not even a month after they were married, he was at a youth rally and comes back to her and says, I feel a call to preach. I've been feeling it for a while, but you know, I've not felt worthy or whatever. So, you know, everybody has their own story. And I do believe if you feel called to ministry, you know, or a certain area in life, you should be into it, willing to be whatever God wants them to be. Cause we don't, we all don't have it figured out. So that was so important for me when it came to Jonathan was knowing that whatever God called me to, that he would also be called to that very same thing, or we would both be in alignment because I waste my life on something that wasn't God's will. Mm -hmm. No, that's so good. I do like that a lot. Um, my husband also, his name is Jonathan. So, um, I'm very partial to that name, but, um, <laughs> It was the same thing, actually, when I came into church, Jonathan brought me in church. He grew up in church, and he was very settled in his belief system. And so I felt the call to minister, to preach, and I felt, you know, a lot of different things um, very strongly within that first year. Actually, I think it was within the first six months. God, like, hit me hard with it, you know? And yeah. One of the things I realized, especially being with Jonathan now for 12 years, we'll be married for 10 years soon, um, is that he doesn't feel the same calling in that sense. However, he still will support me, you know, and our, the bottom line is our belief systems are the same. The core, right. everything that we stand on is the same. If I bring something to his attention, he will look at it from the same point of view, but from his perspective. And so I think that when we're looking at the potential, you know, help me for us, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily wrapped up in a calling or a position or anything like that, but where their heart is and, you know, are they going to hinder the work that God's trying to do through you, you know? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And Jonathan, he has been so amazingly supportive of all the things that I do. You know, it's, it's different territory for him because he's a more um, introverted person, but he's incredible with people. He has a heart up for God. He does feel a call to pastor. And that's something, you know, we've discussed about the future of possibly maybe on home missions work, you know, all in God's timing. But um, he has just been supportive and believed in me. And I think ultimately that's the reflection of Christ, not somebody that necessarily fits a certain mold, but believes in us and supports you. Right. So what was something that surprised you about marriage that you didn't see coming? That I'd have to cook every day. <laughs> <laughs> How much that you would grow when you're placed with a balance. You know, it's so funny that you know, I, I would say I'm a pretty good person, you know, like not bragging or anything, but I, I've let God work in me and I'm, you know, pretty decent. But when we're by ourselves, it's amazing how our attitudes, even if they're internally, never get addressed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's something about having somebody see you up close and personal. It's like the things that I would just not really make a big deal about it. like, oh, somebody cuts me off in traffic in my mind thinking, oh, what a loser, you know? But then all of a sudden I have somebody who's watching me up close that says, oh, babe, you know, it, it's not a big deal or, you know, it's okay. We don't have to be in a rush. And, and you know, in my mind, I'm like, no, let me be upset. But then I'm like, wait, you're making me a better person. And, you know, I, I, I'm changing and, and, little ways and big ways and that's been such a a wonderful experience because I you know it's just I kind of smile and look up at God and I'm like look at you you know you're making me better <laughs> through him that's so good and that's so true it really is you don't realize the things 
that you do when you're alone because, yeah, there's not really many people around addressing it, you know, if you're alone. But, um, but yeah, I can say the same thing here too. There's been so many times that I, you know, way of saying something that to me is just natural, but to him, he's like, wow, that was kind of like with an attitude. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I really didn't mean it. It's just kind of like my natural tude, I guess. <laughs> right. But, That's what I'm have it. but it is, it is definitely something that will help you grow. And I think if you want to grow, and I think a lot of the times, um, some people want to you know, stomp their foot and be prideful and stubborn and say, no, this is who I am. And I've done that many times. But you know what? That's not the attitude of Christ. And I do love no, that. And that will make for a healthy relationship either. Yeah. Somebody right. that's never willing to change. Right. Exactly. So I did want to talk about um, kind of switching gears a little bit here as we're kind of wrapping up. But how do you feel about this new amazing group of apostolic Pentecostal influencers online? I know we talked about it earlier, um, the online world, but I kind of wanted to know, you know, what your take was now that you've shared your life on social media and taking a stand with your faith. How do you feel seeing other people step up and rise to that as well? I absolutely love it. I get excited when I see godly people having influence and using their influence for God and for good. It's, it's incredible to see, you know, I, I think it's very small minded for people to get jealous or envious if somebody has more views or more likes or whatever. That's, that's not the point. I mean, we a, a victory for one is a victory for all. And, you know, of course I, I always want to look out and make sure that it doesn't get to anybody's head and, you know, and one thing that God spoke to me and it's just this past week, it's like, you can't be an influencer if you're not under the influence. And, you know, I think people use that word very fluidly now. And it's kind of like, oh, I'm an influencer because I post this and I get X amount of likes or followers. But to truly be an influencer is Christ. I mean, he only had 12 followers. So, you know, our approach to influencing is not the same as Christ. But we are on a mission to reach as many, you know, Jesus also spoke to 5,000 plus. So, you know, he wasn't always in the small numbers, but I'm super, super excited to see other people coming on board and using their giftings and their talents to expose people to um, this godly lifestyle that we live in a, in a positive light. Because when you can control the narrative, that's when you can truly bring people to Christ. You know, if we left, the world up to exposing the church, then it would always be their narrative and they would always be promoting their perspective of us. And yeah. a lot of times it would not be positive and twisted and miscued. I mean, I, one thing I can't stand is you Google Pentecostal. The first thing that comes up is like five or six photos of people handling snakes. <laughs> yeah. And that kills me. That kills me. That kills me so bad because that's not a representation of thousands if not millions of people and what we have to do is keep being out there in order for people to get a true representation of what the church is and so I'm, I'm super excited to see that other people are getting smart about it they're getting intentional about it and we're really becoming a driving force online and into the world yeah absolutely and honestly if we were handling snakes in my church my husband would not go I'm not kidding exactly <laughs> Like that is such a falsehood. <laughs> it's so, it's just so silly. But I mean, there are, you know, preconceived ideas we probably have of other people's, you know, religions and beliefs. So I really do appreciate right. what you said, you know, just showing up and showing them really uh, the reality and they can yeah. like it or they cannot, but at least we're showing up how God wants us to, you know? Right. Exactly. So the last thing I wanted to know is I wanted for you to share with me one thing that you're excited about right now. I know you moved to Indiana and you're working at um, the church there helping out ministry. You're doing lots of cool things with your house, um, but you're also selling some goods on the side too. So I wanted, I said share one thing, but how about just share a few things you're excited about right now? <laughs> well, 
yes, as you said, we are here in Terre Haute at New Life, and uh, my father-in-law is now the Spanish pastor, so that is an up-and-coming work, and so been helping out with that as well as other various ministries within the English church. So that's been a new adventure for me because I do not speak Spanish as of now, but one day, una dia, hallelujah. So, um, but I'm excited for that challenge and being exposed to um, a culture that's grown very rapidly in our country. And then of course needs to be addressed within the church in order to reach the people that are coming to us. So I'm excited about that. And I, yes, I have been enjoying, thoroughly enjoying being a homemaker. Um, you know, I don't sleep. People ask me that. I don't sleep because I always, when you're a creative, you're getting one idea after another. And it's, as soon as you get one thing done, you're like, oh, but then I could do this. So I've been learning in marriage that you have to go to bed sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, that, um, <laughs> that's been something that's very interesting, but I'm, I've enjoyed just, you know, bringing her home to life. And, you know, me and Jonathan both had this um, concept that we both shared that we said, we want our home to be a haven. We want our home to be a place when people come, they feel the love of God. They feel peace. I want them to want to come back. I want them to miss our home because, you know, ultimately, you know, your home, the family is a reflection of Christ. And that feeling you get when you go to church, nearing in the presence of God, you know, it makes you want more. It makes you feel safe. And I've been able to see how, you know, sometimes we over-spiritualize things or we under-spiritualize things. And when it comes to being um, a housewife, you know, of course, that's just one of my many duties, but taking care of the homes, you know, in Proverbs, it talks about the, the wife is the keeper of the home. It is crazy how it sets the tone for your entire life. And how when you have a place that is peaceful and organized and, you know, well kept. And I know we all have our bad days. I literally have a mountain of clothes in my room right now that I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> but it is showing me the power of setting the stage for my family, you know, and my future family and knowing the kind of culture that I want our children to come in. And so that also goes into what I'm excited about in 2020. You know, I'm not pregnant yet, but we are looking towards, you know, making a baby Bonilla and bringing a little Bonilla into the world. And so that's something I'm super excited about because I've always loved children. And I will be 29 this year. So I'm saying it's about time. <laughs> but um, in conjunction with that, like I said, setting my home is actually worked hand in hand with um, pushing me towards launching a business. Um, I'm actually just calling it Bonilla Abode, which is um, a play off of what I call our home. And, um, you know, I've dabbled in everything, but ultimately to be your own boss is the goal, is the dream. And um, again, like I said, it's, it's all about having something to connect people to. And um, I've just been able to really enjoy the aspect of styling a space. And so I'm looking forward to um, being able to create something that I can use as a ministry, but then also have fun with and also provide for me and my husband and, and our future. So those, those are just a few of the things I'm looking forward to. Um, and yes, as you had mentioned, I do sell some things on the side. And what it is, is I actually have a vendor booth in a place called Glindy's Uptown Mall. So it has over 100 different booths. It's basically like an upscale flea market slash mall sort of thing. Um, you get collectibles, you get all kinds of amazing items. I mean, like every time I go in there, I never leave empty handed, which is, you know, kind of defeating my purpose of having a booth there. But it's been awesome for me to use it to connect to people in the community because even though I do stuff online, you know, and I do witness to people online, there's nothing like that face-to-face -face interaction. And so I, I want to be able to live in my community and reach people where I'm at. And this has been such a wonderful outlet. And I've already met so many people and, you know, they've looked at pictures of my home. I showed them and they're like, oh, wow. And it's incredible that I start talking about my house and end up talking about the church because we live next door. So it's just, it's just, I'm super, super excited to see what God is going to do through all of it and um, his will over ours. And I'm just thankful that he's blessed me with the life that I have. And I'm looking forward to giving him more. 
I'm so excited for you. I really am. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a blast. I love chatting with you. I feel like we've become like old friends now. Absolutely. As we go, can you share where people can find you online? Yes, absolutely. So my social media accounts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram will be Tiff Boney. So it's just the first part of both of my names, T-I-F-F-B-O-N-I. And my company is Bonilla Abode. And that's B-O-N-I-L-L-A-B-O-D-E. And um, also, in conjunction with that, I, ha- I did create, I hadn't mentioned earlier, Apostolic Advocate is a witnessing um, evangelistic community where you can also find that on Facebook and Instagram. And we've got websites coming and all that stuff. So there's a lot of things coming down the pipe. But if you just Google those things or search us in any social media platform, you'll find us and just help connect with the family and let's keep reaching the world. Thank you, Tiffany, so much. I hope that you have a great night. Thank you for um, just sharing your heart and your ministry. And I hope we can have you on in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. If you found this episode inspiring or helpful, would you take a screenshot of it and share it on your Instagram stories, tagging me at Hello Awesome Ministries? It will encourage me that you were blessed. Also, don't forget to leave a review and subscribe so you can tune into future episodes. For more information about all things Hello Awesome, head to helloawesomeshop.com. Until next time, keep your chin up, beautiful.